We need to find a way to get in good trouble, necessary trouble, if we're going to save America. This is Pay. Welcome to the Necessary Trouble Show. Here's your host, my dad, Russell Fugit. Thanks for tuning in to the first episode of the Necessary Trouble Show. I'm excited to have you join us on this journey. Um, of course, the show is named Necessary Trouble after the famous line from the late Congressman John Lewis's speech, explaining to us that we need to get into good trouble and necessary trouble in order to save the soul of America. In this season, like so many Americans, I've pondered what can I do to create an impact? What can I do to further the legacy of our ancestors in this country, both black and white and from all creeds and colors, to really push our country forward to be a more just, more loving and more compassionate country and an example to the world of how to be that way. Of course, like myself, John Lewis was a Christian and like, also like Dr. King, he not only believed in forming a more perfect union, but he believed in a higher ideal of creating a beloved community. And in starting this show, that's what I hope to do my little part in helping to facilitate. I want to thank my production crew and team at Be Terrific for believing in this project. And I also want to thank our producer, Crystal Warner, our executive producer, Henry Hunter, and our music producer, Larry Mack our graphic design artist, Kelsey Abney, and our web developer and strategist, Brandon Lumpkins, and the whole Good Word digital team. This would not happen without you guys. So thanks for tuning in on this journey. We're gonna be here on Mondays and Thursdays every week with about 25 minutes of exciting and enlightening interviews. And we're really gonna be creating space for new voices in this time in the areas of sports, business, and civic life with the bent of social justice. So it's time to create some good trouble, necessary trouble. So for our first episode, we're going to start out with an exciting interview with uh, Anthony Bellman, who is the southeastern region of Pennsylvania's political director for the Joe Biden campaign. And then we're also going to have an interview with Paul Kendrick, who is the executive director of Rust Belt Rising, which is working primarily with down ballot uh, progressives and Democrats to get out the vote and, and, and get progressives elected in the Rust Belt states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin being among them. Following that, we have a very exciting and inspirational interview with Rick Hart. Rick is a 20-year-old student at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, but he's home in Maryland uh, studying virtually while also serving as Attorney General for the student government and working to get out the vote in the greater Atlanta and working with all the colleges and universities in the greater Atlanta system around get out the vote efforts. Rick spoke at the March on Washington a few weeks ago here in Washington, D.C. So you're going to be so inspired to hear from a young voice who's really going to change the world and already has begun to do so. So without much more from me, enjoy this episode of Necessary Trouble. Thanks for being with us on this journey. God bless. Welcome back to the Necessary Trouble show. I'm here with uh, two great guests, two people I'm honored to call friends and also be fellow alum of the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. in Foggy Bottom. First, I'd like to introduce Anthony Bauman, who is currently the South, Southeast political director for the Joe Biden campaign. He's also been a staffer for Congressman Brendan Boyle, and he is co-founder of the PAC Millennials in Action. And then I also have my good friend, uh, Paul Kendrick. Paul Kendrick is the executive director of Rust Belt Rising that's working to uh, get out the vote and elect Democrats in the Midwest states like uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, amongst others. Thank you both for joining Necessary Trouble today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Anthony, I want to, Anthony, I want to start with you. And of course, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about what is happening in uh, Pennsylvania. Can you give us a little bit of insight as to what is going on on the ground in Southeast Pennsylvania, which includes the, the greater uh, Philadelphia region and, and some of the work you're doing there for the Biden campaign? Yeah, so I'm on the ground. I'm obviously, you know, in 2016, uh, Pennsylvania went for Donald Trump with only 44,000 votes. Um, and that is a very short margin. It's a very small margin. It's one that I know the Biden campaign is working tirelessly to make sure that we overcome and we surpass this in order for Pennsylvania to become blue. Um, and for me, I, uh, I'm the political director for Southeast Pennsylvania, so which includes Philadelphia and the surrounding counties. And every conversation that I have uh, with 
with uh, everyday people, with politicals, uh, people just paying attention to this election. They're telling me, Anthony, you have the most important region in the world. Everybody is looking at the Southeast PA. And why is this? Because um, a lot of the votes that in order for a Democrat to win, a lot of those votes are going to come from Philadelphia and the surrounding counties. Um, and down here, um, and the work was 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 started way before I even got on the campaign back in 2008, uh, where, excuse me, 2018, where we saw uh, four women elected to the House of Representatives, uh, where in the Pennsylvania delegation for the U.S. House of Representatives, we had none. And those were four Democratic women. Uh, so we've been seeing this this trajectory of Democrats winning in Southeast PA, more of the counties turning blue um, every single election. And we just want to go ahead and make sure that uh, that we continue that work. So people are excited down here. People are ready to vote down here. Um, and people are are, are just, uh, you know, continuing to knock on doors as much as they can. Now, the Biden campaign, we're, we've been pretty virtual, but I've been seeing um, just everyday people knocking on doors, registering people to vote, making sure that people are educated on how uh, vote by mail is happening in Pennsylvania. So I'm excited about what's happening. I think we're going to turn out the vote in a great way. Um, and in Southeast PA, we're ready. We're ready for November. Awesome. Now, Paul, of course, one of the areas you do cover is Pennsylvania and, and states like West, Wisconsin and Michigan and others aren't necessarily usually linked to Pennsylvania, but they are in this Rust Belt uh, category, so to speak. Tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with Rust Belt Rising and, of course, getting folks elected down ballot also being important, um, not just the top of the ticket. Yeah, thank you, Russ. Um, well, I've spent the last year on Rust Belt Rising training some incredible particularly state level candidates. Uh, we have 150 candidates we've been working with who are on the ballot in these states. And we think they are really key to turning out the vote because they've been messengers in their community, really communicating what we're for as Democrats uh, to motivate voters. And, and you know, when you support candidates like that, you're, you know, you're making calls for them or giving to them really goes a long way uh, in those state races. And, and we need to make more progress in these state houses. But I think they're also key for winning back the White House. Um, but I had begun feeling uh, in the past couple months really concerned about the, the fact that, you know, the kind of thing that so I was the youth vote director for President Obama in 2012 in Wisconsin. I was out on the streets in Milwaukee on campus in Madison registering voters, and you, and you can't really do it safely right now. And so we created a virtual voter registration program targeting 100,000 uh, unregistered Michiganders and 100,000 unregistered folks in Wisconsin. Um, and, and we did a, a mailing to them of a voter registration form and a motivational instructional flyer. And we've been calling and texting them. Uh, we've had more than 500 volunteers participate. We've made 160,000 phone calls, over 160,000 text messages out, um, really helping people know how to get registered and how to vote this year. And we have the supporters we need to win this election who agree with us, agree with our values, agree with uh, you know, Vice President Biden's uh, and, and, and uh, Kamala Harris's platform. Um, but we really need to make sure people know how to vote. They're all registered. They're all set. They have a plan. They know the, the, the option that it feels safe and right for them because there's a few options for how to vote this year. And I think that's going to be the key to uh, ultimately taking back the White House and, and flipping the Senate and, and, and picking up more House seats and, uh, and and really making a lot of progress in these state houses that, that again, are so, so key. So a lot of authentic, visionary leaders I've been lucky to be working with uh, across uh, this Rust Belt region. And, uh, and so, it, it, you know, less than 50 days from now, I'm excited to see it all come together and, and this result of us all making our voices heard. Now, Paul, I want to start with, stay with you. On the ground, I know the national conversation around the presidential top of the ticket just seems to suck up a lot of the oxygen. Mm -hmm. um, what is the energy like around some of these local you know, uh, races? Of course, Tip O'Neill says all politics is local. Yeah. What's the energy been like in the sense around people really being motivated to figure out whether it's by mail, whether it's by showing up, um, how to, you know, what's the energy around voting that you're seeing outside of the presidential race? Yeah, that, I really think that people want 
better leadership right now. They want leaders who will bring people together for solutions, for change um, on things like equality and, and civil rights, on bringing down our health care costs, our prescription drug costs, on, on clean water, on quality schools, on uh, protecting re people's retirement in America. So, uh, and, and on creating better jobs, on using this tragic crisis to to build something better that like really works for working people, uh, that, that, that gives these essential workers, uh, treats them like they, they, they have been essential the whole time, but they haven't been paid like it. And so like, how do we create a country uh, that is better than ever before? And, and so I, and I think in, in lots of different ways, these uh, state and local candidates have their own vision for, you know, in, in their pocket uh, of the Great Lakes region, what are strengths, what are assets of that community that we can really build on um, that will create a, you know, the quality of life for, for, for families to thrive. And, and so I think that's why these are really key messengers that, you know, people may not be talking about them on CNN, but like they've been doing the work, they've been, you know, having volunteers send the text messages, have been calling, have been, uh, you know, good Facebook content, a good video, um, uh, really asking people in their communities to talk to other people that they know and, and, and to use their social media, Facebook platforms. And so, you know, I think that's how you really um, flip places that we've previously lost um, and, and, and take back places that we haven't before. And, and again, just elect some really exciting leaders. So, uh, you know, again, I think when we talk from our values um, and, and uh, this is what Rust Belt Rising has helped these candidates do in terms of communicate effectively with working families, uh, who we are as Democrats, how we're standing up for people and how we're going to make people's bottom line life better, uh, really improve their pocketbook um, and, and help their family thrive, uh, you know, I think that's, that's how we can really win. And Anthony, similar question to you, how is the, the, the Biden campaign coordinating with folks who are, who are running and are you know, focusing more on down ballot races in Southeast uh, Pennsylvania? Well, in, in Pennsylvania uh, period, we have uh, a coalition, the, the Pennsylvania Dems. So and in a sense, we are running a, a coordinated campaign where we're, we're actively, uh, you know, supporting those uh, Senate races. And we actually have some large uh, statewide races uh, because at the end of the day, while people are going to come and, you know, if you're paying attention, if you've been paying attention for the last four years, you definitely want to come out uh, and vote for vote for the president. But it's really those uh, down ballot races that draws out neighbors, that draws out regular community members. Uh, so, you know, they they'll come for for Joe Biden, but then they'll really show out for their state representative or their state senator, the people that they see on an everyday basis, the people that they know that they can go and get uh, constituent services from. Uh, so uh, I think it's going to be a conglomerate. And then um, there are some some major uh, seats in, in Pennsylvania that we're trying to flip and turn blue. Um, so, you know, as we get out and have those awesome candidates knocking on doors and turning out their base, um, that will end up helping the, hop, the top of the ticket as well. And Anthony, staying with you, I saw on the news in the last couple of weeks, there's been some very critical uh, legislation going through uh, the state house in Harrisburg that was attempting to limit access to the ballot and, and I think voter drop box in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't mind, are you able to give us a quick update on where that stands and how that might impact things as we head towards election day? Yeah, we're, it's still in the courts right now. Um, so, but essentially uh, what's happening is that uh, the Democrats in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives uh, would like drop boxes um, and uh, and really, we're, we're also in the courts right now, too, and just determining a ballot. Uh, but essentially, what we're trying to do is just make it easier for people to vote. Um, and Republican, and obviously, we're receiving a lot of Republican op opposition. And also, there was some legislation in the Pennsylvania House that would um, allow us to count our votes earlier. So that way, uh, Pennsylvania isn't holding up the rest of the country in order to find out who, uh, who won Pennsylvania and who could potentially be uh, the next president of the United States. Um, so uh, those things are, are currently in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, um, and there are lawyers working uh, working endlessly in order to make sure it comes out on the side of, uh, on the side of Democrats, um, and just really to make it easier for people to vote. Um, and and now you know, uh, although it's, it's September, 
Uh, normally uh, in, in campaign world, you'll start to hear the words GOTV or get, I mean, hear the letters GOTV or the words get out the vote uh, in, in November. Uh, but because of early voting and because of vote by mail, in, in our mind down in Southeast PA, we are technically in our GOTV efforts because people could potentially start voting um, as soon as a, a couple of weeks. Um, and that's something new for PA. So, but we're excited about it. And Paul, similar to you, I think I saw on the news that in Wisconsin, there's also some lawsuits around the printing of the ballots. Can you tell us a little bit more about where that stands? Yeah, we we were um, pleasantly surprised and relieved. Uh, there was a good decision yesterday um, by the normally very partisan uh, Supreme Court in Wisconsin that the ballots can go ahead and, and go out. They were going to hold them up um, to get the Green Party on them, but but they're going out. So so that's good. It, you know, as is so right on, you know, uh, the election has begun. It's election day right now. And and one thing that keeps me up at night with PA, you know, they don't have same day registration. So like everyone has to get registered by October 19th. We have to help everybody get registered. So that's really important to people to, to get involved with his efforts to, to, to do that because people have to request these mail ballots now and uh, to either if you know they feel safer sending them back from home send them then they have to return them early or like like you said I mean the Dropbox is a great option to drop them off in your clerk's Dropbox um, and then with Wisconsin uh, so those those are imperative as well um, but another option is in-person early voting um, which you know is usually quieter you can you know really do while social distancing um, and then of course there's election day too so so we have to help people make a plan um, there, there, there's a few different ways you can vote, um, but but uh, you know your your vote vo vo <laughs> your voice will be heard. Uh, your vote will count if you but you got to do it as early as possible because you can't you know be sending it back in the mail uh, really late and then it gets in too late and and then you know and it's too late to be counted. So you got to help people do this early and and people can sign up for our effort. Uh, to contact these Michigan and Wisconsin voters to help them get registered, to help them make a plan uh, to do things as early as possible. If you go to rustbeltrising.com, you'll see the link. We'd love to have you get involved. Like I said, we've had so many volunteers, uh, like over 500 that we've trained up and are making these calls. Uh, uh, and, and we've already finished all of our text messages, but are, are, are on the phone with people in Michigan and Wisconsin, helping them know their options, um, take action on them, um, because it's really easy. Uh, it, it, it's harder than it should be in America, but it's still really easy. Uh, the states both have good websites where you can do everything you need to do, um, but we just got to get people there. We got to help them know, you know, and, and it makes people feel more comfortable. They want to vote, um, but, but sometimes there's just a little uncertainty. People are busy. They have their families. They have a lot going on, economic crisis right now. Um, so we just got to help people uh, do that and, and know the couple steps they got to take and do that as early as possible. And then people will make their voice heard. And I think people are really motivated. You know, they, they, they see the, the way that Trump is using racial division and, and, uh, and, and is persecuting communities. And, uh, and, and a lot of people really want change in America to see that everyone is treated equally, uh, that everyone has a fair shot. And, and so we got to make sure people are able uh, to make that vote uh, that is part of that process. Now, we know we're never going to stop protesting. We, we have more work to do beyond one election, but this is like the first step of getting these white nationalists uh, uh, out of the White House um, so we can really get uh, people to believe in civil rights in there and, and, and start making these changes. And then we're going to keep protesting to make sure the changes are made that, that, that we believe in uh, to make sure that, again, that everyone is treated equally in America. Amen, brother. The, the, the work does not stop at Election Day or Inauguration Day. It continues on. Uh, quickly, Anthony, uh, what does the legacy of, of the late Congressman John Lewis mean to you? Um, John Lewis is, when he says good trouble or necessary trouble, um, it is, uh, honestly, so my I work for Congressman Brendan Boyle, and he uh, always tells me about the experience that he had about sitting on the House floor uh, in protest uh, due to gun violence in America. Um, and it was led by the late Congressman John Lewis. Um, so to, to see his legacy where he was, he was a millennial, right, at, in his time, uh, where, he, uh, where he protested uh, for civil rights, and to see that that was something that he, he never gave up. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't there just for a moment, he was there for the movement. Um, and just to see it in the entirety of his life from civil rights to civil rights, um, it is, I mean, it's, it's an amazing, uh, amazing story. Um, I, I, for me, I, I hope everybody 
you know, continues to learn about him. I hope people uh, continue to emulate him. Um, he was the model American and he was a model citizen. And for him uh, and for him, voting was the most like important thing. The fact that we can solve our social issues by voting and we don't have to go to war to solve our own social social issues uh, in, in our country. We can just simply go to the ballot. Um, and for for him, that was important. And I think it's important to to everyone. And what what I what I hope um, that his his memory is just going to continue to do is just to continue to remind people of the importance of voting um, and the fact that people died for it. People um, got beat for it. He himself got beat for it. Um, and and hopefully that that image and that education will just continue uh, to just soar in regards to 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 voter registration uh, and the like. Uh, we need people to get registered. We need people to show out. Um, and that for me, that's the best way to, to honor his memory. Paul, quickly as we conclude, what are your recollections of, of the congressman and how has he inspired you? Well, I just I love him and he's a hero to me, like he is to to, to you too and uh, and to so many Americans and uh, I miss him, but I'm so grateful for his life and um, and so he's actually as, as a, a young man a character in uh, my father and I's book that's coming out um, in January called Nine Days: The Race to Save Martin Luther King's Life and Win the 1960 Election because as uh, good as plug, student, good plug. <laughs> well, uh, because as a student, he and his uh, sit-in movement peers in 1960 decided, you know, in the, the months and the weeks before the 1960 election, that they wanted to make sure civil rights was at the forefront of that discussion. And, and they were doing sit-ins. And, and so he was uh, in Atlanta um, three weeks before the election uh, for a conference that, that in part led to Martin Luther King doing a sit-in that put his life in grave danger. And, and so what John Lewis means to me is, is like the other, his friends of that movement and um, it is the, the necessity for all of us to take bold action that makes us uncomfortable in order to create change, in order to force the issue. And I think that's what his life, I mean, he was willing to put his life on the line and, and, and we should be, um, but it, even if it's not always um, maybe going to jail for civil disobedience, but like there's other things that we could do um, that we might be reluctant to do, that we might be uh, a little scared to do. But if we have some courage um, to do, uh, we can really push forward uh, towards the equality we want in America and civil rights uh, against racism and injustice. So, uh, so he is that constant reminder, that conscience, I hope, to all of us uh, to do those things, uh, to, uh, to, to make that uh, good, tr necessary trouble uh, to create the beloved community we want in America. Indeed, great words to conclude about the beloved community, even something better than a more perfect union. And that's what we're, I know many of us, and I hope more of us will strive for. Uh, Paul Kendrick, the executive director of Rust Belt Rising and Anthony Bellman, the uh, Southeast Regional Political Director for the Joe Biden campaign. Thank you both for joining us on Necessary Trouble and thank you for the important work you're doing uh, to move our country forward in this season. Thank you both for being guests today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for all you do. Welcome back to the Necessary Trouble Show. I'm your host, uh, Russell Fugit, uh, here in the Good Word Digital Studios. I'm uh, honored today to be joined by a special young man, uh, Mr. Rick Hart. Uh, Rick is a student at Morehouse uh, College, and he is the attorney general of the student government association there. Now, normally that would be responsible for enforcing student conduct, but in this season, he is uh, working to get out the vote in the Atlanta region, but also studying uh, virtually from home in Maryland. So uh, Rick, thanks for joining us today. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, this is this is going to be great. I'm looking for I've been looking forward to it for the last day or two. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, first, and, and there's two things we want to get to. Of course, first, tell us about the work you're doing uh, uh, through your position at Morehouse as a student there uh, yep. to get out the vote heading towards election day. Absolutely. Uh, so we are conducting a virtual semester up and through uh, up through Thanksgiving, um, and in that the election kind of runs in tandem with the semester that we have. 
Um, so normally I'd be doing dealing with student conduct violations on campus, um, doing hearings on Tuesdays and Thursdays, that kind of thing. But in this virtual age, uh, the responsibilities of registering students to vote has been given to our Student Government Association and specifically be given to my office, the judicial branch, with my position as Attorney General. Um, so what we've done is we are conducting student voter registration drives virtually. Um, we are conducting a series of panel discussions. One is on voter suppression next Tuesday at 7 p.m. We're gonna bring in some state legislators, um, some activists in the uh, greater Atlanta area. Um, we've put out a voter a voter guide, a three-step voter guide, so that students are aware of how to register, of how to vote by mail, where you can drop your ballot off, et cetera, if you're in Georgia. Um, and we're really just trying to do everything we can to ensure that as many uh, students at Morehouse and in the AUC, uh, which is a, uh, a composed of Spelman College, Clark Atlanta University and Morehouse is registered to vote up through this October 5th deadline in Georgia. Excellent, excellent. Excited to hear about that. Now, how I first came to, to know about you is because uh, your your great uncle was my late, uh, my late uncle, Reginald F. Lewis's college roommate at Virginia State, and he shared an amazing clip of your speech at the most recent uh, march on Washington. Uh, two things. First, tell us about how that opportunity came about. Right. Uh, with the National Action Network and speaking, and then tell us a little bit about uh, your words that day and what inspired you to, to share what you shared with the world. Sure. So I, I first became involved with Morehouse NAN um, as a freshman, uh, volunteering and knocking on doors for Stacey Abrams' campaign in Georgia in 2018. And then less than two years later, I wound up, I'm, I'm the president of the organization now, um, all of a sudden. So our organization is uh, comprised of about 50 or so members. And um, I was blessed and fortunate enough to have uh, uh, been invited by Reverend Al Sharpton, um, Tylee McMillan, who's the uh, Youth and College Division Coordinator at NAN National, um, to speak at the march. I put together team three good brothers of, uh, of mine. We worked over the course of a week, put together the speech, fit it into that two minute window. And I, I really wanted to just say everything that I possibly could to um, explain, highlight where I was in terms of what has ensued in this country over my lifetime, over the course of when this country was founded, over the course of these last four years specifically, especially these last mm -hmm. five or so months, um, just because so much has happened. Um, and fitting that all in the two minutes was a challenge. Um, but I, I finally got up um, on the stage to speak um, and I was super nervous. I mean, you know, people were viewing it from all around the country, all across the world. The audience was still trickling in. Um, and I, I got to, a, there was a specific line that I remember very well, where I talked about how the, the Justice Department um, is working on behalf of uh, you know, students that happen to be white, um, complaining about affirmative action, denying them the right to get into Yale University. And once I got to that line and talked about Bill Barr and uh, the president and, the, and their allies, that's when I said, you know, I'm really feeling this speech and I got comfortable and I was able to finish um, and do the best that I possibly could. Um, so it was the experience of a lifetime. Um, one of the best days that I've lived over the course of my 20 years of life. Um, and it was, again, just a phenomenal opportunity being able to deliver that speech um, with a series of my Morehouse brothers standing right uh, to, to my side, um, supporting me. Um, so it, it was a great day. Your words were certainly chilling and inspiring that day. And just to see a young man like yourself have the courage um, and tenacity to speak truth to power was so inspiring. What can uh, the older generation, myself being included, do to continue to uplift and inspire and encourage um, young people like yourself who are in that college age that, that uh, you know, in the twenties demographic that really have been leading so much of the energy over the summer we've seen in the streets and so much of the activism, of course, that we also see online, but also uh, in the streets in, in terms of uh, organizing to, to move things forward. What can we do to make more space for young people like yourself? Absolutely. Um, I, the first thing I would say is it starts with listening. Um, because listening changes perspectives. Um, you know, young people obviously are the catalyst for the protest movements um, that we have been seeing for the last ex the last se series of months, right? Um, but what I've realized, I've attended several protests over the course, whether it be Baltimore or DC. Um, hopefully I'll be able to attend one in New York within the coming weeks. Um, but the, the age demographic is starting to skew a little bit older because I think people, you know, 35, 45, upwards, 55 are starting to listen to the voices of young people. I mean, four or five years ago, who would have imagined that you would have 55 year old, 60 year old white women in the streets of downtown Baltimore yelling, screaming, Black Lives Matter? You know, I, I didn't think that we'd be seeing that when I was in high school. Um, a high school, when I was a high school junior, now I'm a college junior, and that's what's happened over the course of these four years. Um, so really just growing this movement um, by listening and engaging 
the, you know, these uncomfortable conversations, these conversations that we need to be having, whether it be the brutalization of black and brown bodies or, you know, the discussion of how um, this administration is contributing to a rise in hate crimes or just hateful vitriol towards black and brown people. We need to be engaging in these conversations and people need to be aware of what is happening and how young people feel. Thank you for that. Yeah. Now you talk, you talk about high school and again, it gives me, it resets me in terms of uh, where you are in your life. Right. What was the what event, if there's one or if there's a couple, feel free to add on, you know, whether you were in middle school, high school age, that really kind of triggered your awakening and, and your desire to better understand um, what was happening in America, what we were seeing in regards to Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. um, perhaps what we were seeing and experiencing as a result of, of our current president. Right. What was that event in your in your youth, your youth being relative, but in your youth that really triggered your awakening, your desire to really step up into your leadership? So I would say three events. Um, the first event was I, I was eight years old when Barack Obama was elected to the presidency. Mm. Um, Barack Obama did a phenomenal job given the opposition that he was countered with over the course of eight years by Mitch McConnell, John Boehner, Paul Ryan, and congressional Republicans. Um, and really in that span of those eight years, we were kind of raised being black and brown youth that everything was kind of okay. That's ki kind of how it felt in the moment. Um, and then, you know, you're 14, 15 years old, Trayvon Martin is killed by George Zimmerman in Florida. You see Philando Castile shot and killed in Minnesota. You see um, Eric Gardner strangled to death in New York City. And you're starting to realize as you're getting older and coming of age that these things are happening regularly and have happened, you know, over the course of the last 100 years consistently, um, the killing of Black bodies in America, unarmed Black men and women. Um, in America, Sandra Bland being another example. Um, and the election of Donald Trump was really the moment where I said to myself, like, this country isn't really what I thought it was growing up, if that makes sense. Um, and then flash forward, these last four years have been traumatizing. Um, event after event, this president and his administration, his allies have just shown that they have an inability to understand issues that affect black people. Um, and they do, it seems like they do everything in opposite of um, what we should be doing. Um, you know, if there is some progress made on criminal justice reform, the next day he's tweeting about how um, Ilhan Omar and AOC need to go back to where they came from. So it's like you diminish all the progress you, you, you say you made. And then the, the next event, the third event, I'd say that really was an awakening for me again, was the killing of George Floyd and the events that ensued after that, um, where I was having conversations with people here in suburban Maryland, friends of my parents who happen to be white that I never thought I'd have. They're asking how they can protest, how they can get involved, what can they do in white settings to advocate on behalf of the Black Lives Matter movement. And that was really the third event, um, kind of like stage three of where I am now, and just ensuring that everybody is engaged um, in the political process, um, it, protesting if you're able, and just speaking out against the injustices that we're seeing across the nation. Excellent. Yeah. Now, of course, you were uh, 20 when you gave your speech at the most recent March on Washington, mm -hmm. and uh, the late great Congressman John Lewis was, I believe, 23 uh, when he gave uh, his speech. Um, what has John Lewis's legacy meant for you in this moment? Wow. Um, when you asked that question, I actually had chills because John Lewis, in so many respects, is the father of this movement that we're experiencing now. Um, I kind of view his, his death as handing the torch to us being much younger. Um, I have done what I can do. This is now your turn to lead. Um, I'm, I'm handing this to this younger generation now. And, and when I think about the life and legacy of John Lewis, it, it gives me hope. Um, John Lewis was protesting across the American South and being brutalized day in, day out, was beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, nearly to death beaten. Uh, his brains were nearly beaten. Um, and thinking about the impact that he had on my life, on our lives as Black people in America, um, we wouldn't be able to protest peacefully if it weren't for what the sacrifices that John Lewis made. So, you know, really in all of this, thanking him, um, for being uh, as to where we are now so that we can continue to chart progress going forward, whether it be through protest or um, you know, a, a 
passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act or the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act in the Congress, hopefully next session, if um, we are so lucky. Um, it, it's, it's all because of him, as President Obama said. Beautiful, beautiful, Rick. As we conclude, um, what is ahead for you as you, you know, look at you know, your time at Morehouse and, you know, and, and beyond? What, what are your dreams and aspirations and how do you uh, anticipate uh, continuing to be active in this movement? Absolutely. Um, so upon graduation from Morehouse, I, I desire to attend law school. That's my first goal. I want to um, become trained in voter protection um, and civil rights uh, within the courts mm -hmm. is where I want to start um, as an attorney, um, hopefully in my mid-20s. And then from there, um, I, I do see myself running for office one day. I'm not sure uh, what exactly that office would be yet. Um, there's still some time. Um, but I really do want to be able to craft legislation that helps people that look like you, that look like me um, in this country, because right now we're not seeing that. Um, and hopefully, uh, if you know, depending on what happens in this election and going forward, we will see more of that um, in the future. But I, I really want to be a part of this next generation of leaders in government to change the status quo, to change what we have seen for so long, um, to facilitate the most positive change that we can as a country. Well, I'll be the first to speak it into being a attorney, Rick Hart, a delegate, a mayor, congressman, Rick Hart. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your insight and your perspective. It certainly has been valuable to me, and I know it'll be valuable to the viewers who uh, watch this and hear your voice and see you to understand your very valuable perspective. And please let us know here at Necessary Trouble. Is there anything we can do to, to help you get the word out about things you're working on going forward? We are here to have a space for you and young activists like you. So thank you so much for being a part of the Necessary Trouble show today. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me again. I really, I really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you again. Wow, what a great episode. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for joining us and kicking us off here on Necessary Trouble. Tune in on Monday for the next episode. We'll be back in this space very soon. Until then, let's create some good trouble, necessary trouble as we try to push America to be the country that has been promised to be by our founders. Thanks for watching. I'm Russell Fugit here at the Good Word Digital Studios. You can find more out about Good Word Digital at goodworddigital.com. And of course, the soon to be launched necessarytrouble.com. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching the Necessary Trouble Show. Please visit NecessaryTroubleShow.com to support the show and to learn more. Subscribe to our e-newsletter and podcast, and follow us on social media at Necessary Trouble Show. This is Paige. Thanks for watching.